all say this together. I thank you, Father, that your word has the power to change my life. Today I give heed to it. I allow it to go into my ears, then into my mind, and then into my spirit. I'm a hearer of the word and a doer of the word, and I'll never be the same <laughs> after today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Joel chapter 2, verse 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing babies. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Uh, if you were not here last Sunday, please go uh, on our app or online on demand and watch last Sunday's message because last Sunday I introduced the fast, the 14-day fast that begins today at noon. Um, uh, I, I introduced exactly what, what fasting is and why we're doing that. I'm not going to repeat all that today. I am just going to give you some of the, uh, the basic instructions of the fast in your seat you have a fasting guide that tells well, what you can eat uh, what you can't eat I, I had a couple people before service ask me can we eat this can we eat that I always eat this I'm not sure I could do without that the instructions for what to, what to eat on the fast are on that card however if there's something that's a showstopper eat it uh, now don't uh, this is supposed to be sacrificial so it's not like, well, but I really like coffee, and I don't, you know, I get a headache if I don't drink coffee. That should tell you something. <laughs> Actually, it was three years ago. I used to do the same thing you do. I used to, uh, I would, uh, uh, you know, I would get off of coffee for the fast that we had, and then when I actually, when I started, coffee and sugar were the two are the two things that will grab you by the throat, throw you down on the floor, and stomp on you. Coffee, caffeine, and sugar. And so I used to do the same thing you did, which was for the fast, do without it, and then think, well, gosh, I can't wait to have uh, a cup of coffee again, or I can't wait to ha have a soft drink or whatever. Three years ago, I thought, you know, this is nuts. I'm not doing this anymore. So we had the fast. I got off of sugar, off of caffeine, and I've never gone back. And so now I don't have to deal with that. Haters. I don't have to, because some, some of you are going to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to deal with that. But, um, uh, but if, there, if there's something on there that for a medical reason or whatever, I just I can't live with that. If it means I can't have that, I'm not doing the fast. Well, then, then, then have that and fast everything else. That's up to you. But I am calling a fast. I'm gathering, and according to this passage right here, we dissected this passage last week. I'm gathering the people. Each morning at 7 a.m., beginning tomorrow morning at 7 a.m., we're going to gather here for prayer for 30 minutes. And we're going to pray over the prayer requests that you're going to turn in in a few moments. It's not going to be long. It's going to be, I'm leading the one in the morning, but our elders are going to be leading prayer every morning uh, during the fast at 7 a.m. right here. Um, uh, we're going to pray over those prayer requests. Like I said, we're going to pray over the vision of this house. We're going to pray over the upgrade project, over the grace initiative. We're going to pray over our nation. And, uh, and we are going to include the children. I mean, you know, don't say I, I, we've had so many people bring their kids to the fast on Sunday. I mean, I mean at 7 o'clock uh, in years past when we've done this, gotten their kids up for school and brought them by here for prayer first before school. Let the kids, let your kids know this is important what we're doing. This is serious. Now, don't require your kids to do the same level of fasting that you are. But it is good for you to explain to them that this is a fast. Mommy and daddy, here's what mommy and daddy are doing. But for you, uh, let's, and work out a fast with your kids. What would you, really? I thought it was a good message. Uh, you know, work out whatever, uh, whatever is good for your children. Just work that out with them. Uh, and talk with them about, well, the lights are continuing to go out. Yeah, well, you remember what I told you not too long ago. Connie says when the lights are out and this is on, I look like an angel. <laughs> so, uh, 
So work out something with your kids so that they can participate in the fast as well. We are changing our schedules. This is, this is inconvenient, and it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be changing our schedules. Hey, I, I normally take this route to work, or I normally leave it for work at this time, but I'm going to have to leave earlier if I'm going to go to prayer. Uh, if, if I fast, that means I can't eat this, and I can't, you know, every Thursday we all go out for burgers. That means for two weeks I'm not going to get a burger. I mean, it's supposed to be inconvenient to remind us of who's God and who isn't. Because there's a brat that lives inside of us that wants to control our lives. And so saying no to the brat in you means that you can say yes to the God in you. Um, so remember that fasting is not a diet. If you're only doing without food and you're not praying, it's simply a diet. And fasting is not to change God's mind or his plan. Fasting changes us. Please consult your doctor if you've got an issue, if you, uh, a medical issue of some type. Let your doctor know. Most of, your do most of you are not going to consult your doctor because he's going to applaud and say that's exactly what you need. But consult your doctor if you have a medical issue and do the part of the fast that you can. If your doctor says, no, this says do without this, but you need that, then you, then you follow your doctor's orders, okay? All right, so now today, you know, I talked about prayer and the fact that if you are going to uh, fast without prayer, it's merely a diet. You're just merely going without food. You're not really doing it for a spiritual purpose. And so today I want to talk about prayer heroes, some prayer heroes in the Bible, and learning to pray from the masters. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, <clears throat> it says this. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, then we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now, I'm going to make a statement here uh, that, and I want to explain this because this is important you understand this. Prayer is the most important spiritual exercise in your life. Next to, second to, speaking the word of God in your life. And most of the time, those are the same thing. Now, the reason I would make a statement like that, and I know some of you are irritated and want to rush the platform because you don't agree with that, but I want you to think about this. In prayer, we're speaking to God. The Word is God speaking to us. And it's more important that I hear from God than it is that God hears from me. Now, we got room in our lives for both. I'm not saying we pick one over the, over the other, but I'm saying that prayer is a vitally important spiritual exercise in your life second only to speaking the word, except that most of the time our prayer life consists of speaking the word of God. There are basically two kinds of prayer. There are more kinds. Some people have the 10 types of prayer, the 15 types of prayer, but there are two basic types of prayer. One is worship prayer, and that's where we fellowship with God. We spend time with God, and we spend time in his presence. And the other one is petition prayer, getting our prayer projects accomplished. Whatever it is that you have in your life that needs to happen, whatever God has placed, projects that he's placed in your life, things that you're believing God for, situations that need to change, and we're getting those situations taken care of. Now, if prayer is so important, we can certainly expect to learn from the great men of the Bible and the way that they prayed. And the first Bible hero that I want to talk about is Daniel. In Daniel chapter 6, in fact, I, I want to read something to you in Daniel chapter 6. Uh, well, let me just give you the background here. Daniel is one of three governors of Babylon. And the Bible says that Daniel had an excellent spirit. We talked about excellence just two or three weeks ago. Daniel had an excellent spirit, and he said that he was faithful in everything that he did. And uh, many of the people, the other governors and the, uh, and the people that served with him and under him hated him for that. Because he had an excellent spirit and he was faithful. Let me say to you, on your workplace, there are many workplaces that if you do your work with excellence and you have a faithful spirit, there are people that will hate you. They don't want to see you promoted. They don't want to see you. I, I went to work one place and my second day there, uh, I had two people from the company come to me. I was there two days. Two people from the company said, you need to slow down. 
you're putting out so much production that they're going to expect all of us to do that. That's your problem, baby. I'm here to excel. I'm here to, to excel. I'm here to be promoted. I'm here to do my work with excellence. And so, yeah, there are people that, that won't like you if you do that, but that's too bad. Uh, we want the approval of God, not the approval necessarily of our coworkers unless they have an excellent spirit like we do. So anyway, they, they um, tricked the king by flattering him. Oh, king, you're this. Oh, king, you're that. Oh, king, you're so wonderful. You're such a great king. Uh, and you, you are God, and you deserve to be worshipped. So let's, uh, let's make a decree that anybody who worships any other god besides you will get thrown in the lion's den. And, of course, the king had been all buttered up and was, uh, was you know, feeling all flattered. And he said, what a great idea. So they made an unrevocable decree from the king. But they knew that Daniel prayed to God. And they were, did this to entrap him. So then in Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Now when Daniel knew that that writing, that decree was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And so they did. Uh, have him arrested and the king had made this decree that was irrevocable and so the king had to throw his friend Daniel in the lion's den but then in verse 16 the king gave command gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions but the king spoke and said to Daniel your God whom you serve continually he will deliver you Daniel's prayer life inspired a king who is inspired by our prayer life now I'm not talking about showing off but I'm talking about being so deeply committed to prayer that it affects your whole world and it also says that Daniel intensified his prayer it says that once the decree went out that he prayed three times a day. This was before the conflict arose. Daniel didn't wait to pray and intensify his prayer until he ended up in the lion's den. Many of us, we realize that a bad situation could be coming, but we hope it doesn't come. We hope it doesn't come. We hope that bad situation doesn't come. We hope it doesn't come. We hope it doesn't affect us. We hope it doesn't come. And then we wait till it shows up to start praying. Daniel didn't just hope it didn't come. Daniel prayed three times a day and got himself ready for anything that would happen. And so when you hear of, when you sense, when you believe that trouble might be uh, on the horizon, don't wait till it gets on your doorstep before you start to pray and seek God. Amen? And it says Daniel prayed and gave thanks as he was in the habit of doing. In your prayer life, you need to thank God. You need to thank Him. That's what faith is. Faith is perceiving as real fact, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith perceives as real fact what is not yet revealed to our senses. So when you pray for something according to God's word and you know you have the promise of God's word and you pray for it, then we need to go ahead and thank God for it. You need healing, you need to claim it, and then you need to thank God for it. You need financial provision, you need to, to claim it according to God's word, and then you need to thank God for it and be thankful for it before you even see it with the eyes of your cranial cavity. You need to go ahead and thank God by faith that what he has promised, he has delivered on. That's what Daniel did. Let's talk about Elijah for just a moment. In James chapter 5, verse 17, it talks about Elijah. He was a man with a nature just like ours. Think about what you're really like. I'm not talking about the, the squeaky clean version we see this morning. I'm talking about, think about what you're really like. This doesn't say Elijah looked squeaky clean on the outside just like us this Sunday morning. It says Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours. It gives me hope. 
Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That is referring to a story over in 1 Kings chapter uh, 18, beginning with verse 41, when Elijah is praying to end the drought. It hasn't rained in three and a half years. And now Elijah is praying to release rain. And it says this in verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat, and drink, for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed down to the ground and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, "That's it. he's praying, and he said, go up now. And look toward the sea. So he went up and he looked and he said, I don't see anything. Seven times he sent his servant and said, go again. And it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there's a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. How many of you would get all excited about rain coming from a cloud this big? As small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. So he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and went to Jezreel. Now, we can learn several things about prayer from Elijah here. First of all, Elijah could hear rain before he could see it. He didn't see anything, but he said, I hear the sound of abundance, of rain. So we need to be spiritually sensitive, not only with our spiritual sight, but also our spiritual ears, and because that develops expectation. What is God going to do? What are you hearing from God? What is God speaking to you in your spirit? What is God speaking to you, especially through His Word, that you know something great is on the horizon, that your provision is on the horizon? We're so sensory-oriented that we want to see everything. We want to see it. We want to see everything. We want to see it. But God wants to speak to us and reveal some things to us in our inner man first to to develop that expectation for what it is he wants to produce. He never gave up on what he knew was God's promise. He looked for rain seven times. It has to be there. How, How easily we give up when we don't see God's hand move we don't see God's provision we don't see the thing that we're praying for but I prayed for it I don't see it I don't see it yet I don't see it I don't see it faith perceives as real fact what you don't see yet I don't see it Elijah didn't his servant went out wonder what his servant is thinking about by the fifth time Elijah saying go out again go look again oh seriously it's 12 miles on foot to the sea. I don't want to go out. Go look again. So he goes and looks. He comes back. I don't see anything. The sixth time. What, what would have happened if his servant had given up? The seventh time, Elijah said, go look again. He said, no, I'm not going this time. You've lost your mind. He would have missed out on seeing an incredible miracle. How many incredible miracles have we missed out on because we gave up one minute too soon? Instead of staying with it, staying with it, it's going to happen, it's going to happen, it's got to happen. You know, there are, I'm I'm a preacher, I'm not a medical professional. But, and so there are times when people are in the hospital and um, sometimes people are, it looks like they're getting ready to pass into the next life. And, but they have nervous reactions. Their eyes will twitch, their hands will move, and um, and sometimes the family gets all excited about that, and the doctor or the nurse will say, you know, that's really, that's, that's a nervous reaction. There's really no activity there. Uh, there's no, there isn't any brain activity, but we saw their eyes blink. Well, it wasn't a blink. It was, it was nerves. So I get that. I understand that, but I remember the time that this family was told this about this lady that was in the hospital, and, uh, and her hand would twitch like that. Every time they would speak to her, her hand would twitch, and, uh, they asked the doctor, and he said, yeah, that's not, that's just a, uh, that's an a automatic nervous reaction of some type. He said, that's not really, that's not really any cognitive ability. And, uh, 
So uh, after the doctor left the room, uh, uh, this lady's daughter said, you know, we love this doctor. He's a great doctor. He's been so good to us. But we're going to latch on to what we see here, and we're just going to believe God that that's something more than that. You know, a week later, that lady snapped out of that coma. And it, because they latched on to what they, what they saw, they saw a cloud the size of a man's hand, and they said, that's it. And we're going to stay connected to that and see God do something great. It says, Elijah was a man just like us. So that means that we can pray powerful prayers just like he did in spite of what we're like. <laughs> yeah. Everybody say, thank God. That's, yeah, thank God. Amen. And then here, Elijah is our example of fervent prayer and a righteous man. Now remember, it's interesting that the Bible says Elijah was a man just like us. One translation, maybe the Amplified, says Elijah was a man with like passions, just like us. And yet uses him as an example to say that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Passions just like us, he's a righteous man and his prayers avail much. Passions just like us. He's a righteous man and his prayers avail much. What is that about? It's because our righteousness is not based on who we are and what we can do and our abilities and what we think and how great we are and how, how, uh, how few sins we've committed this week. It's not about that. It's about what Jesus has done on the cross for us that he has become our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that he became what we are so that we can become the righteousness of God in him. So our righteousness, he, uh, Elijah was righteous not because he, he was sinless. He was righteous because of what Jesus was going to do for him on the cross because of the, the redemption that Jesus paid for. And it's the same thing for us. Say, put your hand on your heart and say, I am. This is gonna be, now, this is going to be hard for some of you. So go ahead and swallow the lump now. Say, I am a righteous man. See, and what makes us nervous by saying that is because we know ourselves. I said that, Pastor C, because you told me to, but I know deep inside I'm not. See, you're looking at the wrong same thing. That's why we've got a cross 61 feet high on our building is because we want people to see that it's the righteousness of the cross, not the righteousness of what's on the inside of us. We can't produce anything, but it's the righteousness that Jesus paid for on the cross that makes us eligible for all of his benefits in his word. Let's talk about Elisha. Elisha is Elijah's protege, and the king of Syria has decided he wants to wage war on Israel, but every time he starts to do it, Israel is one step ahead of the king of Syria because they know the plan. Every time the king of Syria wants to attack Israel, they're ready. Because they've heard the plan. And so the king of Syria is really, really frustrated. And he calls his advisors around him. And his, his, his advisors said that over in Dothan, there's a prophet. And that prophet is so spiritually sensitive, he knows everything that you say and everything that happens. Even in your bedchamber, he knows everything about you. So the king of Syria decides, we got to go over there and kill this prophet. So they head over there. And they surround the city. And Elisha's servant goes out to draw water one morning. And he goes up, up on the wall, top of the wall, to kind of look over the horizon to see what's going on. And he sees the Syrian army all around the city of Dothan. And so he panics and he comes back and tells Elisha that the city's surrounded. They're going to kill us. And Elisha says, well, let's go see. And Elisha goes up on the wall with him and looks out over there. And then Elisha says, God, open his eyes that he can see what I see. And the Bible says that the Spirit of God opened his eyes and he could see the armies of God all around the city. He prayed for his eyes to be open. We need to pray the same thing. Let me say something to you. Many of you, when we fill out our prayer request cards in just a moment, you're going to be putting the names of people on there. 
your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your son, your daughter, your aunt, your uncle, a co-worker, a neighbor. And so often what we pray is that their behavior will change. Can I tell you something? If people will change what they see, it will change their behavior automatically. People need to change what they see, change their spiritual perception. Elisha didn't pray that God would defeat the armies of the Syrians. Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be open to be able to see what's already there. And can I tell you, there are things that we're praying for, things that we really want to see God do, things that we want to see God provide that actually are already there. But our perception is so dull. That's why I'm so excited about this fast. How many of us could be a little bit more spiritually perceptive? I could be a little more spiritually perceptive. And so we need to pray instead of, that God, instead of God changing people's behavior, we need to pray that people's eyes are open. 2 Timothy 2.26 says this, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been taken captive by him to do his will. I pray that every morning. There are people on my heart that I pray that for every morning, that they would come to their senses and escape the trap that the devil has laid for them. I don't want God to change their behavior. I want him to change what they see, for them to be able to see what's going on and be able to escape that snare. In uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5, it says, Our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. People have been blinded. And so we need to spend most of our time speaking the word over people when they need to change. We need to pray that the blinders would fall off their eyes and that they would be spiritually perceptive enough to be able to see the power and the work of God. Amen. That was good. And we need to not only pray that for others, we need to pray that for ourselves, that we could become more spiritually sensitive and aware. Then Solomon, let's talk about Solomon for just a moment. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 10 through 11, it says, because of Solomon's prayer. Now, the, the remarkable thing about Solomon is, Solomon is not a priest. Solomon is a businessman and a king. But he's not a king and a priest. And yet God used him, first of all, it's really interesting that the temple of God, God didn't use priests to build it. God used business people to build it. And the priests ministered in it. We're in a culture now where it's up to the preachers to get the works of God built. Wow, it's quiet in here. Okay, I'll move on. Uh, so... It says, it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place. This is 1 Kings 8, 10 through 11. When the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue to minister there because of the cloud of God. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Verse 54, and so it was when Solomon had finished praying all his prayer and supplication to the Lord that he arose from before the altar of the Lord from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice saying, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which, promises which he promised. We're talking about a business person. So the reason that I included Solomon as a prayer hero is because Solomon prayed publicly even though he was rich, powerful, and influential as a business person. He was a king and a businessman, not a priest. Yet his prayer life was powerful, inspirational, and inspiring. It's 8 o'clock on Tuesday morning. In the seventh floor private dining room of the New York Stock Exchange, 20 businessmen, stockbrokers, floor traders, analysts, lawyers, and investment bankers wander in, opening their briefcases, each removing their Bibles. The atmosphere is relaxed. Some jot notes in study guides, orange juice, coffee, and sweet rolls are distributed, and the discussion is warm and fast-paced, low-key and candid. The New York Stock Exchange Fellowship Group is now about 20 years old and is one of hundreds of weekly gatherings nationwide and one of more than 30 in the New York area where businessmen of many levels 
seek to confront the pressures of the corporate world in a biblical context. The meetings are non-denominational, non-ecclesiastical, non-liturgical, and non-partisan. Most of the meetings are open to the business public, but some are more intimate gatherings. One of these meetings from the beginning years occurred about twice a month when William S. Kanaga, chairman of the accounting firm of Arthur Young & Company, Donald Siebert, chairman of the J.C. Penney Company, and Howard Kaufman, the president of the Exxon Corporation, met in one of their offices for an hour of Bible study and prayer. This, what I just read to you, was published in the New York Times business section. I didn't get this out of a religious book. Somebody was inspired by their prayer life to write that in the New York Times. So I want to say to business people here, your prayer life, you don't, you don't have to show up. We're not talking about showing off. We're not talking about trying to be a goody two-shoes. We're, we're, we're not talking about being better than everybody else. But we're talking about being a spiritual example in your company of what God can do in a life if we surrender our lives to him. Fourthly, <clears throat> let's talk about David. David knew how to worship in prayer. Psalm 61 is a perfect example of David, the king of Israel, worshiping in prayer. Psalm 61, David says, Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. This man is not a priest. He's the king, but he's not a priest. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You've given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Worship is a really important part of prayer. In fact, in David's life, it was so important that when David's son was sick, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 12, 20, that when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that his son was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. So David, take a deep breath. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, changed his clothes, and went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. How many of us would do that? Worship was such an important part of his life that even during a tragedy, David worships. Our prayer life during adversity reveals our true faith and trust. Then lastly, the greatest prayer hero of all, Jesus. The Bible says in Luke chapter 3, verse 21, that while Jesus prayed, heaven opened. And we could, I mean, we could, I could spend a whole message, I could spend a whole series talking about the prayer life of Jesus. But let me just point out these two things. First of all, it says that when Jesus prayed, heaven opened. There are only two times in the Bible that says that heaven opens. One of them, Malachi 3, when we tithe, heaven opens. And here it said when Jesus prayed, heaven opened. Then second of all, in Luke chapter 11 verse 1, it says Jesus was praying at a certain place. Everybody say certain place. Doesn't say Jesus was praying all over the place. It says he was praying at a certain place when his disciples asked him how to pray. My question to you based on the prayer life of Jesus is where is your certain place? I just pray whenever I can, wherever I can, just whenever I can get, whenever me and the guy upstairs can get a word in, I, I try to, you know, I try to carve out a little bit of time. No, Jesus had a certain place. And so I want to ask you, where's your certain place? Where's your certain time? During the fast over the next 14 days, be sure to set a certain place and a certain time to pray and seek the Lord. Now, one of those is at 7 a.m. here beginning tomorrow for the next 13 days. But then what about at home? What about, uh, you know, it, what about in your spare bedroom? What about in your closet? What about in your, where, where, what about on your back deck when everybody else is doing this? Where is your certain place to pray? 
and your certain time to pray. That's going to be important during this fast. So speaking of prayer, I want everybody on the back of your seat to take out a prayer request card. And would you hand one to me, please? Everybody take out a prayer request card. You may have filled yours out from last week and already have it, and that's fine. But if you don't, I haven't filled mine out, by the way. Here's what we're asking you to do. Put two things on this prayer, on this card. Now, we'd like for you to put your name. If these are so confidential that you don't want to put your name, we'll still pray over them. But I'd like for you to put your name and then write down three short prayer requests of the things that you want the church to agree with you in prayer over during this fast. And please only use two lines of please. Please don't write a book. Just, just put a couple, couple of, uh, just a couple of lines. Number one, praying for this. Number two, praying for that. Number three, praying for this. And then at the bottom of the card, I want you to write a question that you have about fasting, about the fast. I'm going to be answering those on Facebook. Be sure you, you uh, follow Living Word Family Church on Facebook because uh, each day starting tomorrow, I'm going to be putting answers on Facebook to your questions. So let's go ahead and uh, Myra, where's Myra? Myra, if we can go ahead. and We need some, um, we need some prayer request music. I need for you to pray some, play some prayer request music. And so I want you to go ahead and fill these out. And when you do, we're all going to bring them up here, put them on the platform, and we're going to pray over them. So let's go ahead and fill those out now. When you're finished, if you've already got yours done, if you brought it and it was done, or you've finished it, when you're finished, would you please stand? Still going to wait just another minute while those are still filling those out. Who's excited about this fast besides me? Anybody? Thank you. You know, that's uh, when you can get excited about not eating food, then that's a, that's a big, yeah, you're right, Jim. That's a victory. Come on out, worship team. We're going we're gonna to sing in just a moment. We're going to be praying over these cards every morning, starting tomorrow morning. We're going to pray over your card and believe God with you. Some great things to happen. Amen. I mean, you know, we serve a big God. Amen. Would you just hold your card in your hand here? Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us to fast and to pray over the next 14 days. We take this seriously. We understand it's inconvenient. Everything about this is inconvenient from what we eat to our schedules uh, to our priorities, we understand it's inconvenient. But we give our, our lives so that we can be closer to you, so we can say no to the brat in us, and we can say yes to you that lives in us. God, we pray over these prayer request cards right now, and we ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit that your word would come to pass in each request, God, that you would begin to move now as people of faith have filled these out. And we thank you, God. We thank you, God, for answers that are awaiting. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship.